Bienvenidos al ciclo especializado de formación, trabajo, salud y estrés desarrollado por ARL Sura con la colaboración de FRAX, el Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de los Andes y el Centro de Epidemiología Social. Para nosotros es un placer contar con su participación el día de hoy. Recuerde que este ciclo de formación se compone de cuatro ejes temáticos, diez conferencias, nueve expertos de cuatro países y quince horas de formación especializada. Este curso cuenta con... Eh, 1,586 participantes de 746 empresas correspondientes a 114 actividades económicas y esperamos que con los conocimientos que estamos desarrollando, que se van a desarrollar en este ciclo, se impacte positivamente las condiciones laborales de 626,388 trabajadores que potencialmente tenemos la posibilidad de impactar a través de los conocimientos que ustedes están adquiriendo a través de este ciclo de formación. Recuerde que usted puede escuchar la conferencia en el idioma original o si usted desea tener traducción en simultánea al idioma al español, en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla va a encontrar la opción para activar la traducción al idioma español. Adicionalmente, usted va a tener la posibilidad de participar por dos medios. Primero, el primero de ellos es el chat. Le recomendamos que por favor utilice el chat exclusivamente para comentar sus reacciones, hacer eh, preguntas si las tiene con relación a la logística, cuestiones particulares del de evento como tal, pero que exclusivamente utilicemos la opción de preguntas y respuestas para elevar las inquietudes que usted tenga que eh, quiera que le hagamos al final de esta sesión a la invitada que tenemos el día de hoy. Entonces, recuerde, utilice el chat para realizar cualquier tipo de comentario, reacción que tenga durante el proceso. Recuerde activar la opción de que el chat vaya para todas las personas que están en esta reunión y utilice preguntas y respuestas para escalar las preguntas que usted quiere que al final del espacio realicemos a la invitada que tenemos el día de hoy. La asistencia va a ser tomada al final del evento, no se preocupen, al final, los últimos 15 minutos, a través del chat vamos a liberar la opción de asistencia y va a estar también disponible en nuestra página de memorias donde ustedes van a poder también en el transcurso de la tarde, en los siguientes días, si no lograron contestar la asistencia en, el, en vivo y en directo en el evento del día de hoy, lo va a poder hacer también eh, posteriormente para que puedan estar ustedes tranquilos y concentrados en este espacio de formación que tenemos el día de hoy disponible para ustedes. No siendo más, le doy la palabra a mi colega, la doctora Viviola Gómez, directora del Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de los Andes y quien ha sido la líder de la propuesta pedagógica de este ciclo de formación, quien va a presentar la invitada que tenemos el día de hoy. Viviola, bienvenida. Buenos días, Sebastián. Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Eh, pues hoy vamos a continuar con un tema muy importante, muy interesante. Ustedes recuerdan que hemos venido trabajando eh, en la comprensión de los factores de riesgo, en las causas eh, organizacionales y laborales que pueden dar origen a estrés y por tanto a problemas de salud eh, físicos que trabajamos ya en algunas de las sesiones. Y hoy vamos a profundizar en algunos de los problemas mentales. La sesión pasada, con la invitación que hicimos al doctor Arturo Juárez, profundizamos en uno de esos problemas que tal vez es uno de los que la gente más habla, que es el burnout. Eh, mucha gente no lo conocía o no sabe de qué se trata, pero hoy vamos a profundizar en otro tipo de problemas psicológicos, emocionales, conductuales, que son tremendamente importantes y para ello hemos invitado a la doctora Marnie Dobson. Marnie es eh, doctora en sociología y es en este momento la directora asociada del Centro de Epidemiología Social en Los Ángeles, California, donde trabaja desde el año 2005 con el profesor Peter Schnoll, que nos acompañó aquí también hace algunas sesiones. Marnie ha trabajado durante todos estos años en investigaciones y publicaciones donde se ha enfatizado ella sobre todo en el estudio de los problemas de origen eh, laboral que impactan la salud mental en particular. Eh, ella ha estudiado sobre todo también el tema de trabajo, familia. Eh, Marvin se interesa mucho en los temas de género y su impacto en estas condiciones de trabajo y en cómo afectan a las mujeres y a los hombres eh, de manera diferencial. 
De manera que eh, creo que estamos en manos de alguien que conoce con profundidad el tema y creo que nos puede ayudar a entender con mayor profundidad de qué manera las condiciones psicosociales tienen un impacto en nuestra salud mental. Creo que no siendo más, le doy la palabra a nuestra invitada Marnie, a quien agradezco de manera muy especial haber hecho las condiciones, creado las condiciones para poder acompañarnos hoy. Thank you, Marnie. Welcome. Thank you, Viviola. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Everyone can see that? Yes, we can see it, Marnie. Thank okay, you. Great. So thank you, Viviola, and I just wanted to um, thank um, Sebastian um, and Sur Americana um, for putting this fantastic uh, series together. And I'm very uh, fortunate to be here uh, to talk about mental health uh, issues in the workplace and particularly how occupational and psychosocial risk factors at work uh, can impact mental and psychological health. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the overall ideas uh, but, you know, around mental health, what it is, what psychological uh, health means, um, but mostly about the way in which work stresses, which you've heard a lot about if you've attended other uh, sessions in the series, really do uh, play a role in causing mental health problems. So uh, I hope to cover uh, a fairly wide range of topics today. Um, it is a very broad field. Marnie, so yes. sorry that I interrupt you. I, no in, some people say that it's hearing very low. If you can ah. speak uh, louder, it will be great. Okay, here, let me turn my volume up too. How's that if I speak into the microphone more? Great, okay, great, good. thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, it's a very broad field, this field of psychosocial risk and mental health. And there's been a lot of research over many years now. And we do know a lot about this field. Um, and so I hope to just share a little bit of the research with you um, and answer questions you have about uh, dealing with mental health issues uh, in the workplace as we go forward. Here we go. So this is a brief overview of what we're going to cover over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to give you some definitions, as I mentioned, and we're going to talk about the prevalence and costs of mental illness, just so that we can see what a burden uh, mental illness and mental health issues are, um, are on societies all around the world. Uh, this is not just a problem um, of high income or developed countries. It's a problem that is now global. Can you hear me now, Sebastian? Yes, everything okay, is great. Fine. Um, mental illness, mental health issues, um, um, what we call multifactorial. They have a lot of different causes from biomedical to individual personality, family history. And we're also going to talk about the social or structural factors like work that play a role in psychological health. Um, I'm going to cover some of the work stresses you've heard about um, in terms of what we know about their impact on mental health and well-being. You've heard about job strain and effort reward imbalance in the first two uh, series uh, sessions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about precarious work and job insecurity, which is also a global problem and is a stressor that really does impact on mental health. Uh, long work hours we'll talk about as well as work family conflict, which many of us know, especially during this pandemic, has been a major um, issue with trying to manage uh, family responsibilities and continue working. Uh, emotional labor is something that I have really been interested in for a long time. Um, it's not a very well-known topic, but uh, we know that uh, it does have an influence on mental health. We'll touch on uh, workplace bullying, which is becoming a global concern. It's something that is um, a growing problem um, in many countries. Um, and also has an impact on uh, employee worker health. And then finally, work stress and suicide. Um, unfortunately, we have seen increases in suicide, as I'll talk about in a moment. And we know that uh, aspects of the work environment, job characteristics do play a role. Um, and we're finding some new research about that. So I'll present some things about that. And then solutions, you know, um, we won't be able to get too into that, but um, fortunately in the next few lectures, um, we will hear a lot more about solutions and interventions to try to 
really reduce the level of mental health and mental illness in the workplace through prevention of work stress and through the promotion of psychological health and safety, which I'll touch on towards the end. So first of all, some definitions, and then I'll talk about the prevalence of mental illness and, and the costs to us as societies. So in general, when we talk about mental health, um, it's a spectrum. We begin with, uh, you know, on the far end, we, we can talk about um, well-being, um, positive psychology, um, mental well-being. These are factors that um, are really about the overall resilience and well-being of, of people. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have mental disorders and mental illness, which is really uh, how the medical industry, medical field, uh, treats and diagnoses uh, mental health concerns when they become a very entrenched part of a person's life. And then in the middle, we have um, these ideas of uh, psychological distress or depressive symptoms. In the occupational health uh, field and occupational epidemiology, we often measure these elements, psychological distress and depressive symptoms, um, because there are symptoms that arise before a disorder occurs or before mental illness may take place. So it's a place in which we can begin to um, address issues that might become more problematic. So you'll see in some of the research I present today that um, the outcomes are looking at psychological distress and de depressive symptoms, as well sometimes with the psychiatric diagnosis of, of major depressive disorder or mental, um, other mental illnesses. But the most common mental illnesses we all know of and we've heard of, I'm, I'm sure, are anxiety and depression. Um, anxiety has symptoms like feeling restless or on edge, being easily fatigued, having difficulty concentrating, being irritable, muscle tension, diff difficulty controlling feelings of worry and so forth. Depression is sort of the other side of the coin of anxiety in some ways. They often go together. Um, depression can include sadness, loss of interest or pleasure, feelings of guilt or low self-worth, disturbed sleep or appetite, and tiredness and poor concentration. And these can persist, these kinds of symptoms, and if they do persist for a period of two or more weeks, um, then clinically, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists can um, label it as, a, as an illness or a disorder, or what's called a major depressive episode. So there's a spectrum of feelings and, uh, and experiences that we have that um, may not be clinical, but may also still uh, be of concern. Um, and obviously, we want to catch things early and be aware of mental health issues um, as early as we can in order to prevent them. So globally, mental health is a major issue. An estimated 264 million people are affected by depression globally. Mental health conditions now cause one in five years live with disability, um, and depression is the leading cause of disability globally. Two of the most common mental health conditions, as I mentioned, depression and anxiety, cost the global economy an estimated $1 trillion each year. So that's a lot of money. What we're looking at is the cost of healthcare for people with um, major depression or anxiety disorders. Um, it can include disability costs. It can include lost uh, work time, absenteeism, and so on. And we'll get more into those costs in a moment. Unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in mental health conditions. There's been a 13% rise, according to the World Health Organization, in mental health conditions and substance abuse disorders uh, in the last decade, at least to 2017. And we know that these may be even higher since the COVID-19 pandemic. Suicide is the second leading cause of death now, unfortunately, among 15 to 29 year olds. And it is also increasing globally. About 800,000 people die each year um, due to suicide. It's the equivalent of one suicide death every 40 seconds, according to the World Health Organization. 
And the important thing here is that common mental disorders, as I've mentioned, anxiety and depression, are strong risk factors for suicide, meaning that people who end up committing suicide are more likely to have anxiety or, or depression. But we know that suicides are preventable um, with timely and evidence-based and often low-cost interventions. And as you'll see, work stress and the factors at work, if we attend to them, we may be able to have an impact on reducing uh, suicide or suicide ideation through reducing anxiety and depression. So unfortunately, um, I live in the United States, we have a lot of data. And so some of my data is um, based on the US, um, United States prevalence. But um, I think what's important is that this, these trends that we're seeing in the United States are being seen in many other countries around the world. So in the US, the prevalence of mental illness um, is about one in five workers who experience some kind of mental illness in a given year. About 18% or 42 million uh, United States uh, individuals have anxiety disorders, and almost 7% have major depress depression. Serious mental illness costs the US around $193 billion just in lost earnings every year. Again, we're seeing an increase in poor mental health in the United States, just as the World Health Organization showed. These questions were asked in various surveys. Um, have you experienced, how many days in the past month have you experienced poor mental health? You can see that from 2001 to 2002, those numbers have increased significantly. Suicide that is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States currently. Um, it may be higher. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in the United States um, among 15 to 29 year olds. And in 2020, uh, there were 48,344 suicide deaths. We know, interesting, that there's a gender difference in suicide. Men die by suicide three and a half times more often than women. And an interesting statistic, the suicide rates for men aged 50 to 54 in the United States rose from about 20.6 per 100,000 people to 30.7 per 100,000 people. That's a 50% increase between 1999 and 2010. Now we might think, why would we see so many uh, suicides among the age group? Well, one of the factors may have been that in 2008, we saw a global economic recession. And unfortunately, oftentimes layoffs and unemployment um, negatively affected uh, men in these age groups. So in general, the point here is that suicide rates are increasing, especially in working age populations. This is a suicide rate for male by age groups um, in the United States between 1999 and 2017. And you can see uh, that the increase is here. Another interesting report, um, a series of reports was released by um, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who are epidemiologists. Um, and they found alarming increases in mortality from not just suicide, but also drug overdose and alcoholic liver disease, especially among white middle-aged Americans with a high school education or less. And you can see the red lines there. Over time, you can see how uh, the trend has increased uh, dramatically for people in this group. These, uh, these they labeled and have actually have written an interesting book called um, The Deaths of Despair, um, linking uh, job loss, um, economic fragility in many um, communities that have lost jobs uh, to uh, maladaptive coping uh, mechanisms that people might use to deal with uh, these kinds of financial, economic and work stressors, including drug use, um, including alcohol abuse. And we'll talk about that briefly in a minute. Uh, some interesting statistics in Colombia. Um, we know that suicide deaths have been increasing in Colombia also over the last several years. Um, increases have also occurred among working age Colombians between 20 to 39. But some of the increases also due to increase among uh, younger children, which is, is very sad that we're seeing this. Um, depressive disorder was the main cause of this uh, increases in suicide.
So COVID-19, uh, while all of these increases have been occurring, we also just faced or are continuing to face a global pandemic, um, which has really thrown a lot of our lives into uh, chaos. Um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to have an um, ongoing impact on mental health. We've seen increases in stress and anxiety. We know that existing mental illnesses um, can be made worse. Um, partly because of the social isolation associated with lockdowns and physical distancing, the uncertainty over potential exposure to a deadly virus, over maybe losing uh, loved ones, um, also over unemployment, which has um, been a major problem throughout the world um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we've also seen the trauma that's been caused by loss of loved ones um, from the disease, and, and that has definitely uh, had an impact on mental health. Healthcare workers have been dealing with uh, these surges, um, overwhelm, overwhelmed hospitals, um, and these workers are also at greater risk for burnout, as you may have learned last week, and suicide. Substance abuse and suicide are also on the increase. So what are the costs? Why uh, do we need to co be concerned at workplaces around Colombia and around the world about the impact of mental health and depression? Uh, this study um, draws a sobering conclusion that depression actually costs employers around $44 billion a year just in lost productivity. So what do we mean by lost pro productivity? We mean that um, people who have mental health issues might be more likely to be absent from work um, on sick leave or disability. Um, they also might be coming to work because they have to, because they have to earn a living, um, but not be able to perform at full capacity, what we call presenteeism. Um, so between these two, you can see that those folks that have uh, depression compared to no depression had much higher um, lost productive uh, time um, hours per week. However, the total economic burden just of a major depressive disorder is now estimated to be around $210.5 billion per year, according to the American Psychiatric Association. So that takes into account healthcare costs, care of comorbid conditions that many people with depression also face, um, and that brings the costs much higher. And again, as I've mentioned, uh, dis depression, psychological disorders are major sources of disability throughout the world. Um, you can see on the left-hand side in the United States, Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, the, the uh, amount of disability due to psychological disorders is at least on a par or higher than musculoskeletal disorder, disability, and cardiovascular disability. So what are the causes of this, these kinds of mental health uh, disorders or illnesses? Um, we know that there's a genetic and family history. Um, it's strongly uh, related to um, childhood trauma um, as well as to individual um, and personality effects, which might be related to childhood trauma or um, the kinds of um, experiences we have as we grow up. We also know that life events um, divorce, loss of loved ones, uh, exposure to natural disasters can impact on mental illness. But what we're going to focus on today especially uh, is the case for the social causes of mental illness. Um, we know that there are factors such as gender, age, socioeconomic status or poverty, um, race and ethnicity, as well as occupational status and work stressors that also play a role um, in causing mental illness and mental health problems. We call these the social determinants of mental health. And um, this includes gender. Um, for example, women experience depression about twice as often as men. Um, but men's suicide rates, as mentioned earlier, are over three times higher than women's. So why is that? We know that women have uh, the disproportionate uh, amount of household responsibilities. And we also know that women are in the workplace in full-time jobs in greater numbers than ever. So balancing health, household responsibilities, childcare, as well as work can be major stress, stressors for women, which might lead to higher rates of depression. 20% uh, of people 55 years and older are estimated to have a mental health problem. But interestingly, in terms of age, mental health usually improves with age. We can think of some of the reasons why that might be. 
um, for example, as you get older, certain uh, experiences in life give you a, um, a higher sense of self and self-esteem and purpose. You might have been successful at having children, getting married, you may be more accomplished in your job, um, and not have the pressures that uh, people experience in their midlife years where they're managing work and family responsibilities. So we do see um, an overall um, decrease in mental health disorders uh, among the higher age groups, as you can see in this graphic. Those in the 50 plus age group have a much um, lower percentage of depression than people in the working age groups. We know that socioeconomic status and poverty affects depression and mental health. Uh, you can see here in this graph that those people with the light blue bars um, live at um, below the US poverty level. This is the United States data. Um, and those are folks that have the highest percentages of depression. Poverty, low socioeconomic status, meaning a lack of educational opportunities, lower incomes, are all major financial uh, stressors. And that kind of insecurity and uncertainty when you're living below the poverty line uh, is a stressor that can impact mental health and does, as you can see in this chart and many, many other um, studies have shown the same thing. Interestingly, we also know that occupation can impact on uh, mental health. This is a study um, in the United States um, using the Quality of Work Life Survey, which is a national uh, representative survey. It's given out every four years. And you can see that those people reporting 14 or more days in the past month when mental health was poor. So uh, the highest number of people reporting poor mental health for 14 or more days occur in the retail trades, in the service sector, as well as transportation, manufacturing and so on, also agricultural and forestry. So occupation is having a role as well. So why is it important to address mental health in the workplace? We know that work can give people a sense of purpose and meaning. Um, it helps with well-being and health. Uh, we know that obviously having a job and being able to pay rent and pay the bills is uh, a fundamental uh, necessity for people. Um, which is also an important element of mental health. And on the flip side, we know that unemployment is a risk factor for poor psychological health and physical health. Why should we worry about mental health in the workplace? Well, work is a location where people spend most of their waking life. It can also be a site to address mental health concerns. The workplace can be affected by the mental health of workers, um, which also needs to be accommodated um, as an illness or a disability, um, but maybe also in terms of prevention and awareness. Stress from work, as we talk, we'll talk about today, can also affect the mental health of workers. So work can be affected by the mental health of workers as well. Millions of people, as you've seen now, face living with mental illness and it can affect every aspect of life, including work. We know that around three in 10 employees experience mental health problems. The University of Michigan study of around 440 uh, depressed workers, they found that of those workers, 82% had difficulty concentrating, 83% say they lack motivation, 24% complain of chronic physical pain, 50% missed one to three days of work, and only 41% felt they could acknowledge their illness and still get ahead in their careers and only 14% had taken advantage of any employee assistant programs for workers who suffered from depression. So more and more workplaces are making resources available to uh, working people that may have uh, depressive symptoms or um, mental health issues. Um, but unfortunately, the trend is that many workers are afraid to take advantage of these resources for fear that uh, there, there won't be enough confidentiality or that people may find out that they have these mental health problems. So one of the problems we have to face in the workplace is stigma. Um, stigma of mental illness is one of the major issues in trying to uh, address and prevent the effects of mental health issues in the workplace. Some of these uh, stigma are related to myths about mental illness. The idea that depression is not a real medical problem. 
that we know that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance uh, in the brain and that it can affect life in much the same way as any other chronic disease such as diabetes or heart disease. Another myth, people snap out of depression by thinking positively, you know, trying to cheer someone up who has depression. But it is not a sign of weakness or laziness or not thinking positively enough. It is a health problem. Someone once described to me that having a major uh, clinical depression is like being on a highway uh, in second gear and you can't get out of second gear. <laughs> you see everyone speeding by and you're stuck in second gear. So it is a major um, concern in terms of how people function in the world. Only emotionally troubled people become depressed is another myth, but we know that depression affects people of all ages, races and backgrounds, not just people with previous emotional troubles. And we also know that stress and trauma often contribute to depression. So the World Health Organization and the ILO released this great report on mental health and work. Um, they concluded that the incidence and costs of mental health problems are increasing globally. And they suggest that while the origins of mental instability are complex, a number of common threads appear to link the high prevalence of stress, burnout and depression to changes taking place in the labor market due partly to the effects of economic globalization. So what they're pointing to are things that we've just mentioned, unemployment, job insecurity, short-term contracts, time pressures, rationalization, tighter deadlines, quality demands and rising productivity requirements. As companies seek to compete on a global market, they're having to try to do more with less. Oftentimes they'll outsource uh, parts of the business in order to save labor costs. They might lay off staff or merge and so forth. All of these uh, kinds of factors that uh, companies use to try to be more competitive can result in these kinds of uh, job characteristics, which we'll see in a moment, lead to stress. So how does work affect psychological or mental health? And we're going to talk about this, and I'm sure you've learned now, hopefully, um, about the relationship between uh, stress and health. But ultimately, what we understand is that um, any kind of hazard or threat that's perceived as, as such by an individual can provoke the fight or flight response in, in humans. People are poised to uh, deal with any kind of threat to them. In this case, there might be threats that are more symbolic. Am I doing well enough at my job? Am I going to lose my job? Is that coworker going to be unkind to me and bully me for the rest of my job here? Um, these are perceived stressors. They're perceived as uh, they're stressors because they're perceived as threats um, to economic well-being, to continuing your job. It has the same biological effect on your body. It's a short-term effects include um, blood pressure increases, heart rate increases, muscle tension, shortness of breath feeling shaky and achy, oftentimes symptoms of anxiety. And this can also, over time, if it's not resolved, if the threat doesn't go away and day after day you end up in the same environment where there are these hazards, it can lead to long-term effects, which we call strain or distress. And the symptoms of this include things like headaches, sleep disorders, exhaustion, musculoskeletal pain, and mental health issues high blood pressure and CBD, as you've learned about. These are just some of the symptoms of work-related stress. They can be physical, they can be psychological, they can be behavioral. Physical symptoms can include fatigue or muscular tension, headaches, psychological symptoms, as we've mentioned, depression, anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, unable to cope, pessimism, and then behavioral symptoms which can be an increase in sick days or absenteeism, aggression, problems with interpersonal relationships, a drop in work performance, mood swings, and so on. So what are the sources of work stress? What are the sources of these kinds of symptoms that we see as a result of stress? And we've mentioned them a little bit, but you can see that there are certain aspects of the work environment that um, end up in creating these kinds of um, workplaces that cause a stress response. These can include assembly lines where the work is monotonous and ongoing. 
It can include precarious work where you may not have a permanent employment contract. You may be a day laborer working from day to day. You may not know when uh, you'll be hired next. Um, you may work for a temporary agency. More and more, these jobs are becoming more common. Um, it's more common to be a what they call a gig worker, especially here in the United States. Um, and many of those never will have a permanent employ employment contract. And so be protected with things like sick pay, um, the right to organize a union, uh, and other things. I mentioned restructuring and downsizing as companies compete on the global economy, which can result uh, in uh, changes in staffing levels, for example. Um, those that are left behind after downsizing may have to take on the work people who were laid off used to do. So that may also result in longer hours and overtime. So this quickly is an overview, and you may have seen this from some of my colleagues, of how we think the social factors of the, of the global economy result in labor market changes, which result in changes in work organization, which result in these job characteristics that we've heard a lot about, including higher job demands, higher efforts and low rewards, um, job insecurity, even bullying and harassment, which we'll talk about, and that these have also uh, resulted in behavioral coping mechanisms or maladaptive coping mechanisms such as smoking, lack of exercise, alcohol consumption, eating, as well as mental and health outcomes and productivity costs. So we know that the research shows that work stressors are playing a role in chronic illnesses. The kinds of work stressors that we see in, in uh, in workplaces, uh, including high job demands and low job control, which we call job strain, effort reward imbalance, which hopefully you heard um, from Dr. Johannes Segrist, uh, long work hours, uh, work family conflict, and so on. Uh, they're also being found to be related to burnout and depression. We know that work stress also affects health risk behaviors for unhealthy lifestyles. The stressors such as job strain and effort reward imbalance are associated with increased smoking, um, higher alcohol consumption, opioid abuse, which is a major concern here in the United States, uh, physical inactivity or lack of exercise, and also eating behaviors um, leading to obesity. Work stress can affect cardiovascular disease and mental health directly. We've seen the mechanisms, but it can also influence these chronic diseases indirectly. So we know that, for example, those who uh, might feel stressed and use smoke or smoking or alcohol to cope are more likely to experience cardiovascular disease. This uh, chart shows how we think that work and working conditions are playing a role in opioid use disorder. For example, work stressors or, uh, can impact and lead to work injuries, which can lead to over-prescription of opioids um, and over-reliance on opioids or abuse, which is leading to opioid use disorder. Work stressors can also lead to coping through alcohol and then through drug use. Uh, so we know that work itself is playing a role in uh, the use of opioids um, and it's an, a site in which we can begin to address the opioid epidemic by dealing with some of these issues before the uh, opioid abuse gets too far along. So what is the research evidence? We know that uh, job strain, we have evidence about job strain, effort reward and balance and these factors. Um, over many years now. Some are, are much newer, and I'll touch on those. Um, there has been a need for longitudinal studies, which means that we need studies that control for mental health disorders like depression at baseline. Why do we need that? Because we need to know whether people can end up with depression after being exposed to these kinds of work stressors. Okay, so there have been a lot more longitudinal studies that do control for depression, meaning they take people who have depression already out of the picture and they look at people who are healthy when they begin the study and they follow them up over several years to see if they develop depression. We also know that in, through these studies, um, we need to answer the question of whether mental health disorders themselves negatively appraise work, lead to negative appraisal of work. Um, so it's possible that people with depression or burnout already 
might feel more overwhelmed and overloaded. So one of the ways to get to deal with this through research is again longitudinal studies to be able to control for mental health in the first place. So we know uh, when you've learned about job strain, hopefully um, those of you have been in it earlier, um, jobs with high job demands and low decision latitude are particularly stressful. In this one study of over 7,000 British, British civil servants, the Whitehall studies are very well known longitudinal studies that have been going on for decades now in, in Great Britain. In this one particular study using Whitehall data, they found that British civil servants with repeated exposure to job strain, meaning they were affected by job strain at time one and at time two during the follow-up in the study, that this was associated with an increased risk of major depressive disorder. So people who had repeated exposure were more than two times likely to develop major depressive disorder. Effort, reward, and balance. There have been uh, systematic reviews showing that an imbalance in efforts and rewards um, can lead to a twofold elevated risk of incident depressive disorder over 2.7 years. So people with effort, reward, and balance at time one uh, and time uh, have, have, are more likely to experience a depressive disorder at time two compared to people without effort, reward, and balance. We also know uh, some interesting um, relationships between effort, reward, and balance and occupational position. So for example, those that have a lower occupational position, meaning they may make less income, they may have lower education, um, if they also have effort, reward, and balance, and you can see that on the circle, they have a much higher risk of depression than someone who has effort, reward, and balance um, and is in a higher socioeconomic position. So the combination of being in a low occupational position and with effort, reward, and balance increases the risk quite substantially, as you can see there by the green bar. Precarious workers and uh, employment. We know that uh, having permanent jobs uh, are, is obviously it decreases the uncertainty of whether you're gonna have work or not. Globally, we know that uh, Many people are subject to unstable employment, lower wages, and more dangerous working conditions. Um, people who are precarious receive no social benefits, are denied the right to join a union, are scared to organize. And people without permanent uh, employment are more likely to be women, ethnic minorities, and migrant workers. In this study in Finland, they've shown here that those folks that are on a temporary or freelance um, or seasonal or on-call employees have a much uh, higher um, risk here for uh, depression compared to those with a fixed term contract on the side um, and compared to permanent employees. And this is for men and for women, the risk of being in those kinds of jobs is even higher. Job insecurity and organizational change. Um, these are changes in the worldwide economy, which mean many workers face layoffs and growing insecurity. There have been several prospective studies that have investigated the effects on worker health of downsizing or mergers or restructuring. In this one study, you can see that those folks who experience chronic insecurity, so at time one, they were asked are you, do you feel secure in your job or do you have uh, some concerns about losing your job? And those folks that were uh, experiencing chronic insecurity between time one and time two here on the right um, were much more likely to experience uh, depression. Long work hours. Um, we know that over 50% of full-time workers in the US uh, work over 40 hours a week. 50% uh, of salaried workers report working over 50 hours a week. And almost 15 million people work full time on evening, night, or rotating or irregular shifts. Um, long work hours, meaning greater than 50 hours a week, is associated with fatigue, with greater alcohol abuse, um, with depression, as well as cardiovascular disease and stroke, as this new report from ILO um, that just came out this year shows. 
that uh, around, they estimated around 745,000 deaths um, occur each year as a result of long work hours. In this one study, we see that working 11 hours or more a day was associated with um, a doubling 2.5-fold increase of major depressive episode compared to those who were working a standard 7 to 8 hour day. Work-family conflict, we've all experienced it. I know I have during this last year with children and working from home. But it's a form of inter-role conflict in which the role pressures from uh, work and family domains are mutually incompatible. So that participation in one role, like for at the home, is made more difficult by participation in another role. Studies of work-family conflict have also shown it, there's an association between work-family conflict and work hours. So those who are working more than 48 hours, um, report working more than 48 hours a week, are much more likely to report work-family conflict. The implications of work-family conflict for health. We know that around 70% of men and women in the United States report some work-family conflict. It can manifest as time strains, missed work or family activities, or the spillover of stress from work to home and from home to work. There's many adaptive strategies that people can take to deal with work-family imbalance. Um, we know that, especially during COVID, some people had to resort to having one spouse or partner exiting the labor force, reducing their hours, or working different shifts so they could take care of children. This can often lead to uh, a reinforcing of gender inequality because women because we're usually the, um, more likely to be the care caregivers, um, are more likely to leave jobs or cut back at work. And this was especially so during the COVID pandemic. We know from research that work-family conflict is associated with sleep problems, burnout, and depression. Now, emotional labor is also uh, has an impact on mental health. So emotional labor was developed originally by a sociologist named Ali Hochschild. And she described this as the management of human feeling in the early 80s and found it particularly uh, to occur among human service workers, such as flight attendants, as you can see. The emotional labor is the requirement as part of your job to create a sort of publicly observable or facial or bodily display that provokes usually positive responses in customers or clients. So, you know, smiling at customers, making them feel, um, you know, cared about um, is really uh, being the face for the company. Um, and oftentimes, um, flight attendants and other service workers are required to do this as part of the job. We know that there are common occupations that do this kind of labor as part of the job, including retail and grocery workers, um, healthcare, social workers, police, um, elder care workers, teachers. Um, it's part of a fast growing industry, um, the retail industry um, where emotional labor is done quite often, uh, is uh, predicted to grow by 16.6% as our healthcare and elder care um, industries as well where emotional labor is more common. We know that emotional labor can be considered a work stressor because there is um, included because they're, they're of the requirement to display positive feelings. So the checkout folks in the, in the grocery store, you know, have to smile and say, how are you? Did you find what you needed today? Even if they're not necessarily feeling, you know, very cheery. Um, there's also a requirement to suppress negative feelings. So if you are being um, treated unfairly by a customer, the negative feelings that, that provokes um, often have to be pushed aside. And that causes what we, say, what we call emotional dissonance, where you're, you're kind of acting in a certain way, not according to how you're actually feeling. That's called surface acting. So folks who do emotional labor um, are often having to fake feelings. And uh, we'll see in this um, next slide that faking feelings may actually bring on burnout. And this study of nurses um, concluded that those nurses who don't have a natural ability to control their emotions and who feel like they're regularly faking feelings at work, they're more likely to experience burnout, depression, and to be absent. 
So emotional labor itself, as you'll see in this next slide, doing work that requires um, presenting a certain kind of emotional state to customers or clients is not in itself a problem. In several studies, um, the idea of having an emotionally demanding job is not necessarily associated with the components of burnout, um, but is related to high personal accomplishment. However, in terms of whether people are having to hide negative emotions or display positive emotions when they don't feel that way, this was significantly related to emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. So one of the concerns about doing emotional labor is trying to get people to feel more connected to uh, the work they do uh, so that they're not necessarily um, having to experience that kind of surface acting. Workplace bullying. In 2021, 30% of individuals are bullied at the workplace. This is according to a US workplace bullying survey that's uh, been done every year for a number of years now. Another 19% have witnessed bullying. Over 76.3 million workers, according to this survey, are affected by it. Interestingly, they asked questions about remote work during COVID, and they did find that remote workers reported bullying, around 43% of them, that bullying still occurred while people were on online Zoom meetings. So what is workplace bullying? It's the repeated mistreatment of an employee by one or more employees. Uh, it includes abusive conduct that is threatening, humiliating, intimidating, can include work sabotage or verbal abuse. According to the Workplace Bullying Institute, 70% of perpetrators are men and 60% of targets are women. 61% of bullies are bosses. Unfortunately, the stereotype is real. Oftentimes, the power that someone has to, uh, can be uh, abused and people um, who are supervisors um, or bosses can uh, target people who are subordinates. In 60% of the cases, unfortunately, employers are still um, not doing anything or they may even worsen the problem. According to this one UK uh, report, they, they calculated that workplace bullying costs society approximately 682.5 million pounds. That could be in turnover of people leaving organizations as a result of bullying, could include absenteeism and sick leave, um, and so on. So the health cons consequences, and there are health consequences as a result of workplace bullying, 40% of bullied targets suffer health problems. And unfortunately, hostile workplaces uh, that include bullies often lead to less productive employees and less successful companies. Employees who feel undermined at work are more likely to be stressed and may miss work for health reasons. And bullying is strongly related to higher risk of mental disorders. Also, witnessing someone get bullied at work, being part of a hostile workplace, is also linked to depressive symptoms. So bullying is really something that needs to be taken uh, you know, more time with and attention. Um, 31 US states uh, since 2003 have introduced um, a healthy workplace bull bill of some kind against uh, workplace abuses, including bullying. Um, and Scandinavian nations, um, Great Britain and Australia, um, have also uh, instituted anti-bullying laws uh, specifically. Work stress and suicide. So what do we know about whether work stress can impact on suicidality? This is a study that looked at suicide ideation. Um, suicidal ideation is the uh, is a measurement of whether someone has ever thought about suicide. And the th thinking about suicide is strongly correlated to actual suicide attempts. They included 22 studies and they found that, and they looked at the major stressors, job control, high demands, effort, ward and balance, and so on. They found that all of these elevated the odds of suicidal ideation. There were six studies that actually looked at suicide and they did find a relationship between poor supervisor or coworker support and low job control and suicide. There were only two studies that looked at suicide attempt, but both of these suggested an adverse effect um, of exposure to job stressors. 
So this, these authors concluded that um, there is some evidence of associations between job stresses and suicide. There are gender differences. We know that men with, high, with job stresses are at a higher risk for suicide than women with job stresses, which is interesting. But there is a need for more longitudinal research on the subject. Um, and you can see here a colleague of mine has done a longitudinal study um, of US workers asking whether chronic work stresses are longitudinally associated with suicidal ideation. Uh, he found that low job control, job strain, and long work hours were longitudinally associated with moderate or severe suicidal ideation in a US working population. This is one of the first longitudinal studies that shows a connection between job stress and suicide. So in summary, the research on psychosocial work stresses um, has progressed a lot over the last couple of decades. There have been three major systematic reviews that have assessed over 60 longitudinal studies. They've assessed the major psychosocial stressors um, and their relationships to common mental disorders of many types, uh, including new onset, major depressive disorder and a range of depressive anxiety and mood disorders, as well as depressive symptoms. These were <clears throat> studies that only looked at longitudinal studies, sorry, reviews that only looked at longitudinal studies, controlling for depression at baseline, as we mentioned before. <clears throat> they found moderately strong evidence for the impact of bullying, job strain and effort reward imbalance, especially on mental disorders. So we know that work stress is playing a role in mental disorders, but how much of a role? Uh, many researchers use population attributable, attributable risk percentage, which is a calculation that looks at the portion of the incidence of a disease that's due to a particular risk factor, and then suggests the incidence of a disease in a population that is eliminated when that risk factor or exposure is eliminated. Excuse me, so for example, uh, the smoking population attributable risk percentage for pneumonia is 32%. So what that suggests is that 30%, 32% of pneumonia um, cases could be eliminated if smoking was eliminated. So when it comes to work stress, some folks have also uh, looked at attributable risk. They've found that in this one study, job strain attributable depression by gender ranges from 10% to 31% in men and 5.3 to 33.6% in women. And in this other uh, study, an Australian report, they've found similar numbers that job strain population attributable risk is 14% for common mental disorders and 15% for depression. So what that means is that if job strain was eliminated, we could eliminate 14% of common mental disorders and potentially 15% of depression. And that's just one work stressor. So we know that work stress itself could be a great place for reducing the amount of mental health issues in the population. Work stress costs us. More than 120,000 deaths per year um, have been estimated to be caused by how companies manage workers, by work organization. Up to 5 to 8% of annual healthcare costs, which is a major amount in an economy like the United States. And in a study of over 40,000 employees, they followed over time, they found that the combination of job strain and effort reward imbalance was associated with doubling the risk of disability due to depression. So when you begin to look at all of these um, psychosocial stressors put together, we can really be looking at um, large costs, uh, contributions um, from work stress. So work stress is a significant economic and social burden to individuals. It impacts our health and our longevity. It impacts the quality of life of families and children and communities. And to organizations and society, it increases healthcare costs, disability, workers' compensation costs, losses of productivity from increased sick leave, absenteeism, and staff turnover. These costs are barriers to creating greater innovation, engagement, and sustainability 
also to creating healthy organizations and healthy people. I know we're near 10 o'clock and I wanted to mention some of the solutions in the prevention of work stress. Um, if I take five more minutes, is that okay, Sebastian? Yes, Martin, no problem. Okay, great. So one of the things we've painted this picture and I know it sounds very depressing, but I think the important thing to remember is that if work stress is a contributor to mental health problems and psychological problems, then it is also a place in which we can reduce the uh, effects of work. If we reduce the effects of work stress, we can reduce the amount of mental health issues that might develop from work. We know that there are different ways in which we can prevent stress. And this is a well-known stress intervention triangle that shows that uh, preventing the stressor at level one on the bottom is the most effective way um, of dealing with uh, stress um, and reducing stress. Level two is to reduce the stressor in the workplace. And level three is dealing with the individual response to the stressor. And we'll talk about what that means in a moment. But it is considered less effective than preventing the stressor in the first place. So it can take time to get to level one, like preventing the stressor. Obviously, that seems to be the most efficient way. If we can prevent a stressor from occurring in the first place, then people won't end up as stressed and we won't have to um, deal with the symptoms of stress and then the health problems that come from that. There are immediate and short-term solutions for individuals that we know. There are stress management techniques can reduce the symptoms of stress and help individuals cope. Um, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, other things that uh, can enhance people's ability to cope with stress. They're, these are very important. But these techniques and programs are helpful, but they, again, don't address the sources of stress. So if you go back into the workplace day after day and these same things occur, then the stress management techniques may only put a band-aid on the situation because you're going to be facing the same threats, the same sources of stress day after day, and uh, eventually it will have an impact, a long-term impact. So what other approaches can we take? And hopefully in the next few sessions, you'll learn more about organi organizational approaches to reducing and preventing chronic work stressors. Um, these include uh, things such as work environment and job redesign. They include increasing work control over work pace. They include addressing and looking at hours and shift work at staffing levels and so on. Reducing the stressor really is a, a great form of intervention and this can help uh, this can happen through increasing co-worker and management support, which buffers stress, more support in the workplace, giving uh, input by workers into procedures, which enhances job control, more communication and sharing of information in an organization, as well as work role clarity and job skills training and so on. Uh, many countries have instituted uh, work stress prevention policies or psychological health and safety standards. I know Colombia is one of them. Um, the EU has guidelines and directives. The UK has instituted um, work-related stress management standards to help guide employ employers in trying to prevent uh, work stress. Uh, in Canada, they have passed a national standard for psychological health and safety in the workplace. Even in Japan, they've passed a national policy uh, called a stress check program that, like in Colombia, requires uh, employers to um, have employees fill out a, uh, a stress um, survey every year and evaluate their own workplaces. And again, other, other countries, including Colombia, have also passed some kind of guideline or health and safety standards relative to psychosocial risk. Unfortunately, in the US, we're lagging behind. We don't have guidelines regarding work stress prevention or healthy work. But just recently, um, some of you may know that there has been an international standard passed by the International Standards Organization, um, which is a psychological health and safety at work standard that would go along with occupational health and safety management systems. It provides guidelines for uh, employers to manage psychosocial risks. Um, so we're very excited about this in the United States as we're hoping that 
this might uh, propel some movement forward to dealing with these psychosocial risks of work stress in the workplace. Um, and also these international organizations, the ILO has called for an amplification of the need for prevention of psychosocial risk as a result of the pandemic, um, especially for the most vulnerable workers. So there is a movement right now to really acknowledge the effects of psychosocial risk and work stress um, for workers particularly. And uh, that said, I hope uh, later on in the program um, to rejoin some of you along with my colleague uh, Peter Schnall and we will uh, introduce our Healthy Work campaign, which we've been working on for uh, a little while now. Um, and it really is about trying to raise awareness about the effects of work stressors um, on mental and physical health. So uh, we look forward to introducing you to some of the projects and uh, activities we're doing as, as part of the Healthy Work campaign later on. Thank you. Thanks to you, Marnie. Okay, thank you, Marni. Um, I will now present you a couple of questions that people have been sending. Um, now they are coming a lot more, but I will begin with um, the following, Marni. Um, one second. So there's first here a comment. I. I'm not sure yeah. this is a quite... Be, be remember if you can please perdón, do it perdón, in, perdón, in Spanish. Perdón, 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 perdón. Perdón, sí, 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 sí. Estoy aquí hablando con Marni, lo siento, discúlpenme. Eh, eh, a a Marni tradu le tradujeron lo que di alcance a decir. No, ya te dio, pues, perdón, estoy aquí medio despistada. Ok, Marni, la primera eh, pregunta, eh, más que pregunta, es un comentario de alguien que dice que cree que los niveles de salud mental en edades avanzadas tienen que ver con la expectativa de vida y hasta qué punto se realizaron esas expectativas y también tiene que ver con las expectativas de afrontamiento de lo que no se ha logrado, lo cual considera a esta persona que en Colombia se falta por fortalecer y por eso esta persona cree que no necesariamente en Colombia la salud mental en edades avanzadas es mejor. Creo que es un comentario a unos datos que tú presentaste al principio mostrando que al menos en Estados Unidos y en otros países también lo he visto, la salud mental de personas mayores parece ser mejor, ¿cierto? Eh, oh, no están yeah, escuchando. Sí, sí. Un momento. Oh, sorry, go un momento ahead. porque están diciendo que no escuchan. Ok. Eh. Aquí una persona nos dice que sí está escuchando. Recuerden que eh, Viviola primero hace la pregunta en español y se le va a hacer la traducción a Marnin, luego Marnin la va a resolver y eh, ustedes van a escuchar si tienen activado en interpretación el idioma español, van a escucharla en español. Acá hay unas personas que ya nos confirman que sí, que okay. se escucha. Eh, okay, Marnin, perfecto. please go ahead. Ok. Eh, Marni, hay varias personas que, o una persona, perdón, que pregunta si los estudios que tú has presentado donde muestras cómo el estrés laboral impacta la salud mental, si en esos casos se tuvo en cuenta o se controló la predisposición personal o, person o familiar para tener problemas de salud mental. O sea, creo que la persona entiende so I que... That, I missed that last part of the question. Creo que la persona estaba entendiendo que tener una predisposición personal o familiar a tener problemas de salud mental es un factor de confusión. Y entonces la pregunta es si en los estudios se controla esa disposición personal eh, para saber que lo, el impacto sí es del estrés laboral y no por una condición personal. Yes, so... Uh, In many studies, they do control for things like negative affect um, and mood disorders. Um, for example, I think in the Whitehall study, they did take into account, um, and that's been used a lot uh, to look at um, depression onset um, and other kinds of mental health or common mental health disorder onset. And they have controlled for negative affect and neuroticism. 
Um, not all studies have, um, but I think uh, it, you know, in 20 years ago, uh, this was a much more um, of a concern that uh, negative affect and mood disorders be controlled for. Um, and they have been, and, and we, we do still see a relationship between work stress and mm -hmm. uh, depression and, and mental mm -hmm. health. They're also controlling for depression at baseline or other kinds of mental health issues at baseline can also um, try to deal with some of that um, individual factors as well. Perfecto. Gracias, Arnie. Um, aquí hay una pregunta muy interesante en, en particular porque viene en un contexto en el que Colombia se acaba de aprobar que va a haber una disminución de las horas laborales, de las horas legales, que hasta ahora han sido 47, 48, entiendo, y entiendo que van a pasar a 42 a la semana, no de manera inmediata, pero sí en el mediano plazo, fue lo que leí. Eh, hay una persona que dice, ¿es hora de disminuir las horas laborales? Pareciera que la respuesta es sí, pero ella comenta, ahora a los que reflejan una afectación emocional y psicológica por la carga laboral nos llaman la generación frágil, por ende, desarrollamos temor de decirle a la empresa que tenemos estrés, depresión o cansancio acumulado. Eso genera una acumulación aún mayor y lastimosamente por eso ella cree que hay un incremento en los suicidios. Yeah, I, I think um, the data is pretty clear that working very long hours is bad for your health, your mental and your physical health. And, um, You know, I, I think part of the problem is that, uh, you know, as the younger generation comes up and, and realizes that these um, traditional ways of working, you know, working many, many hours, sacrificing your family life and your health for the company um, is not desirable. And is, it makes it very difficult um, to maintain a healthy uh, non-work life. Um, when those kinds of norms are, are in place. And, and of course, it benefits employers to have people doing that, you know, and anyone standing up to, to them and saying, hey, I need time to, you know, take care of myself and recover from work um, by working less hours um, is a reasonable demand. But of course, you know, it, it, the status quo Um, is benefiting uh, employers because they want to, you know, get as much productivity out of their workers as possible. Mm. Um, but we've, we know that long hours after a certain amount of time actually um, don't result in more productivity. Mm. And we know that it can result in health problems which end up costing employers a lot more. So mm -hmm. rather than blaming individuals for, you know, being weak or, you know, not being strong enough, being fragile, I think taking a, a good look at the data and the science um, would benefit employers. It would benefit them in keeping staff and employees uh, and, and preventing them from burning out and leaving, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Muy but bien. of course, it's hard, it's hard to do that as an individual. And, and that's why we have laws in place that benefit everybody um, and regulations in place that, you know, in this case might help uh, require employers in Colombia to attend to the psychosocial effects of long hours, mm -hmm. and that, that's a positive. Uh, la pregunta que sigue, Marnie, es un poco en respuesta a lo que acabas de decir. Eh, porque, y es una pregunta complicada de contestar. ¿Qué posición adoptar frente a las directivas de una organización que piensan que la principal fuente de estrés de sus trabajadores se encuentra en su vida personal y no dentro de la empresa. Oh, I see. So the question is, you know, how do you convince a company that the stress is related to work and not a personal life? Mar Marni, si me esperas, eh, de pronto puedo leer la siguiente pregunta o hay una pregunta que creo que está relacionada okay. con esto y que podría ayudarnos a contestar porque esta persona dice... ¿Consideras que la ausencia de vigilancia epidemiológica en las empresas es un impedimento para monitorear los efectos del estrés laboral y la gestión de sus causas? Las empresas 
son carentes de sistemas de información confiables que permitan observar diferentes efectos de manera interrelacionada, como por ejemplo ausentismo, condiciones de salud, accidentes, rotación, desempeño, entre otros. ¿Qué nos puedes recomendar? Creo que esas dos preguntas están relacionadas, que es por un lado yeah. Los, yeah. Los, los empleadores que creen que los problemas no son del trabajo y al mismo tiempo no tienen un sistema de vigilancia que permita precisamente establecer que sí lo son. Sí. Yeah. Well, I think it's really hard to convince uh, em employers without a surveillance system. You know, I really do think that assessing the, uh, you know, the existence, the, you know, the levels of um, these kinds of work factors that we know are related to uh, absenteeism, that are related to uh, mental health issues, that are related to high blood pressure and so on, um, you know, need to be in place because there is a tendency for people, uh, you know, for society, um, for employers and, and even in the medical field to want to blame these problems on individuals mm -hmm. and to not look at the sources of stress in the workplace, but to say individuals aren't taking care of themselves at home. They are, you know, they already have mental illness and they're coming into the workplace and, you know, not working as hard. Um, but these, these are problems that um, need to be identified. Um, individuals are not in a position of power oftentimes unless they have labor representation um, to uh, really get employers convinced that uh, work is a source of stress. But mm -hmm. I know that uh, in Colombia, as in many countries, there are requirements for employers to assess the psychosocial risks. And once understanding that, they can address it. And ultimately, we know that addressing psychosocial risks might actually improve individual behavioral risks. So doing both, you know, could have a major impact um, on individual behavioral risk as well mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, addressing the work environment. Mm -hmm. Um, ok, es cierto, Marty, eh, en Colombia hay una ley eh, que se cumple a medias o se cumple eh, a, a, en, lo, en, en las más mínimos posibles, pero bueno, es un tema que vamos a, a tratar en este en esta ciclo de conferencias en un par de semanas un poco más en, en profundidad. Um, aquí tengo otras preguntas. Eh, esta que es... Es, me parece una pregunta muy interesante. Marley pregunta, ¿cómo lograr que los trabajadores en las empresas aprovechen las estrategias a las cuales tiene acceso para controlar el riesgo psicosocial? Muchas veces se estructuran programas que buscan el bienestar mental de los empleados, pero la mayoría de las veces, a pesar de su difusión, la asistencia es muy mínima y en la época de pandemia, pues, ha sido mucho mejor, menor. Esto al menos pasa en el caso de Colombia. Y yo supongo que estos programas a los que se están refiriendo son programas más de nivel individual. Aprender a manejar el tiempo, aprender a manejar el estrés, cosas que se ofrecen de manera para los individuos y dicen, pero de todas maneras las personas no los utilizan. I mean, it's a it's a really good question, and it's it's a fundamental question because we have the same concern here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> even when there are employee assistance programs available um, for people who have mental health problems, you know, as that one survey showed, only 14% of employees use them. Um, but you know, you have to sort of think about it from a worker's perspective. If you're a manager and you're trying to attend to <clears throat> stress in in your workplace. Um, you know, because of the ideas that we have about stress and mental health, there's a lot of stigma attached. And I think individuals fear that if they come forward and participate, they may be seen as weak or fragile, as we've heard. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's a barrier to participation. Um, what we've found in some studies in the United States where, um, uh, for example, a program to quit smoking has been put in place, Um, in this series of research studies, they found that if the employer was also attending to the, um, the, the levels of um, pollution in the workplace at the same time as providing, then people felt more confident that they could be involved in behavioral change mm -hmm. because they were also taking into account 
the um, issues that were um, potentially impacting them in mm -hmm. the work environment as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think a combination of offering individuals the, the choice to um, try to cope and manage with stressful symptoms while also being accountable and taking uh, uh, responsibility for the factors at work that could be improved is going to help employees feel more um, like participating in these programs. They feel more like the organization is acknowledging their own work environment factors while also, you know, individuals can take part in, uh, in you know, trying to help uh, themselves to uh, experience more well-being. Mm -hmm. En esa misma dirección, Marty, conectado con eso que estás diciendo, hay una, un comentario aquí de alguien que dice, los estilos de liderazgo son sin duda roles muy influenciadores para la aparición o no del estrés, es decir, para la prevención en sus equipos de trabajo. Por eso es importante, afirma esta persona, fortalecer liderazgos participativos y tener libre, líderes integradores con habilidades que le permitan entender a las personas. Y yo agregaría que no solamente entender a las personas, sino que entiendan cuál es el problema y que efectivamente ofrezcan las soluciones que son y no paños de agua tibia que no son la solución a, lo, a, la, a, a la causa real del problema. Ex I mean, excellent question, and I think, um, you know, a, a lot of this does start with the management style and the management ethos in terms of thinking about what, uh, you know, what the problems are in the workplace. And I think too often companies want to um, just blame the workers, you know, blame employees for the problems and not take a look <clears throat> at the source of the problem. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what we're finding is that... Uh, Companies that uh, in, include employees in decision making um, have employees involved in health and safety committees, or uh, involved, uh, you know, in uh, feedback um, about mm -hmm. workplace problems. Actually, mm -hmm. involving employees um, and and having them participate in identifying the problems, <clears throat> and listening reasonably um, to ideas and solutions that frontline employees might have because mm -hmm. ultimately we know from research that that working people you know know what the problems are they know what the stressors are in the workplace you talk to i've done many focus groups with working people I've sat with them people for hours and they can point out exactly where the concerns mm -hmm. are so it would benefit uh management uh, in terms of efficiency uh, mm -hmm. to go directly to the source And, and, and talk to them about things that could be improved in order to improve the, the, the stress levels. Because otherwise you're handing down expensive programs that aren't going to really focus on the problem. You know, mm -hmm. and that may be why uh, workers don't participate as much. So mm -hmm. involving workers, I think, is a major priority. And, and it's something that we um, believe as part of the Healthy Work Campaign is, is mm -hmm. essential to really providing healthy and uh, stress, less stressful work. Excelente. Gracias, Martín. A propósito de eso, yo quiero hacer caer en cuenta que tú eres la directora del Healthy Work Campaign, eh, cuya slide, cuya eh, eh, imagen están viendo en pantalla. Eh, Marni y Peter van a profundizar en esta campaña eh, dentro de tres semanas, creo que es. Eh, y allí hay una serie de recursos, tan, tanto a nivel individual como organizacional, que ustedes van a comentar para que muchas de las personas que están escuchando puedan tener otras opciones, otras ideas de eh, intervenciones o, o formas de incluso de evaluar y de medir. A propósito de medir, Marni, aquí hay una persona que menciona un tema que es un problema de comportamiento que no mencionamos porque como tú lo dijiste al principio, hay muchísimos y tú seleccionaste aquellos que son tal vez los más estudiados o los más prevalentes pero aquí señalan el presentismo y lo que preguntan es cómo identificar el presentismo en las organizaciones y en personas que están trabajando en teletrabajo en casa, si existe alguna herramienta para identificar el, ese, ese presentismo de esa manera. There's a lot of different measures for presenteeism um, that researchers use. Um, uh, the, you know, some of them are long. Um, You know, presenteeism is a way of understanding if people are having to come to work um, when they're sick, 
you know, and oftentimes I think we have to be careful um, not to focus too much on the lower performance, but that, you know, why are people coming to work sick? And, and how can we get people, you know, better treatment or um, deal with the causes rather than the effects? Because the effects of, uh, you know, that you capture in presenteeism are the effects of, you know, health problems oftentimes. And, you know, people have, like I mentioned, have no choice but to come to work and because they need the they need to get paid and they need to pay their bills and so on. Um, in the Healthy Work Survey, which we've developed as part of the Healthy Work Campaign, which is an online survey that you can take um, if, as an individual, but we also have one in development for organizations, includes a couple of questions that um, ask about um, whether you, know, you have difficulty concentrating or whether you feel overwhelmed by your workload that could identify performance issues um, among workers um, anywhere, whether they're working at home or in the office. So there are little, uh, you know, uh, methods by which employers can identify this as a problem. But I think it's important that uh, employers are also educated to understand why work performance might be affected in, in some mm -hmm. people. Marnia, aquí hay un comentario de alguien eh, que probablemente es un directivo o es una persona que está en una posición de dirección. Eh, y que hace el siguiente comentario, dice, pero algunas veces los empleados no son conscientes de que el estrés viene de sus hogares y de su vida personal. Entonces, para las empresas es difícil disminuir estos factores de riesgo, ya que cualquier medida laboral es insuficiente. ¿Cómo abordar este tipo de negación por parte del empleado? Um, I think that, uh, you know, th there obviously is stress coming from a home life, you know, as, as a mother of two children who have been home for the last year, <laughs> <laughs> doing homeschooling and trying to work at the same time is, is complicated. But, you know, I think the reality is that uh, many, many employees uh, have families and they have home lives and they have work lives. And I think the reality is that uh, you can't separate the two. And I think that's the mistake that managers often make, you know, well, maybe it's just work life. I mean, home life that's causing all the stress at work. You can measure that. There are surveys available to measure work life conflict. Um, they can tell you whether the, there's family stress impacting on work or whether the work stress is impacting on family. Um, sometimes it's both. And I think identifying the, the factors in a large you know, organization um, is possible. And you can separate out um, the sources of stress at work from the sources of stress at home. Um, but I think as, in terms of putting that data into uh, dealing with that data and the results of that data, I think we need to begin with an understanding that all human beings have a work life and a non-work life. And, uh, to, and, and that the workplace has to understand that we're not robots, that we just can turn off everything that happens at home any more than we can uh, turn off a mental health problem, you know, uh, when we become workers. So just like uh, mental health has to be accommodated in the workplace, I think um, struggles at home and, and family life will have to be accommodated in the workplace also because it's just part of having being human beings and part of having a human workforce. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think that's the practical solution is, is understanding that there may be work stressors and home stressors, but that mm -hmm. human beings have, have both. And, uh, you know, unless you want to not hire anyone with a family, <laughs> which, you know, would be would leave a major sector of the labor market unemployed, then um, then the work environment and workplaces managers have to deal with the mm -hmm. potential that of work family conflict. Um, Marnie, yo podría agregar un, una pequeña cosa a, lo, a tu respuesta y es, si las empresas tienen programas de vigilancia epidemiológica, van a poder mostrar más fácilmente a un empleado que su estrés probablemente no tiene que ver con el trabajo en caso de que realmente el origen fundamental sea de origen personal, ¿cierto? Pero en la medida en que no hay una vigilancia epidemiológica pues se, se vuelve un asunto de la palabra del uno contra el otro y de tratar, o sea, hay unas formas en Colombia de todas maneras de pedir una calificación, dice el origen de un problema es de origen 
estrés laboral o de estrés personal, pero son procesos que son muy complicados, toman mucho tiempo y la persona tiene que estar tremendamente afectada para que, para que sea tomado en serio. De manera que creo que el hecho de tener un programa de vigilancia epidemiológica es una manera que le permite a los empleadores de tener herramientas para poder decir es de origen laboral o no es de origen laboral. Voy a mencionar rápidamente, Marni, eh, una, la última pregunta, porque hay varias, algunas no he leído porque son un poco alejadas del tema, porque se tocaron en sesiones anteriores o van a ser tocadas en próximas sesiones. Pero esta eh, comentario pregunta dice lo siguiente, en muchas ocasiones las intervenciones que se ejecutan frente a los factores de riesgo psicosocial están enfocadas en brindar capacitación y formación a las personas para que afronten de manera individual dichos estresores, pero no se intervienen los factores desde su estructura, por lo que el estresor seguirá allí. En este contexto, ¿será que esas intervenciones individuales a través de capacitaciones y formaciones, lejos de mejorar la situación, pueden empeorarla? dado que con esto la empresa tiende a considerar que ya está interviniendo el riesgo psicosocial y dicha intervención genera una carga cognitiva mayor para el empleado porque se siente más culpable por no poder controlar sus respuestas ante dichos estresores. ¿Cuál debería ser el papel de los líderes allí si deben alinearse con las metas y políticas de las empresas y al mismo tiempo velar por la salud de sus trabajadores? Well, I think, I think the, the question is referring to kind of wellness-oriented or individual behavior programs that employers might in, implement to deal with psychosocial stressors, the effects of psychosocial stressors. Because as we know from the, the series, you know, there's a difference between the stressor, which is the source of stress, and the experience of stress and the symptoms related to stress. Now, of course, there's many methods to try to cope with the, the symptoms of stress. There's maladaptive methods like smoking and alcohol consumption that individuals resort to because they have no other coping mechanisms. Or you can teach coping mechanisms that are healthier, like meditation and breathing exercises and so on, which can be effective. But as we've tried to say, the sources of stress are not being dealt with then. And I think what we're finding in the research is that some combination of offering individuals you know, stress management techniques but also as a company dealing with the sources of stress that might be resulting in the stress is going to be way more effective because mm -hmm. ultimately uh, reducing things like job strain, reducing effort reward and balance by you know, addressing workload and staffing, these are hard choices. But if mm -hmm. they ultimately uh, result in um, a lower turnover of employees, of lowered healthcare costs, of lowered presenteeism because people are burned out at work, then you're going to be saving money. So mm -hmm. I think um, companies need to, uh, you know, understand and be, maybe be educated to understand that it's not just about individuals coping. It has to be uh, companies taking responsibility for improving the uh, sources of stress in the work mm -hmm. environment. As well. Excelente, Marta. Eso es parte de lo que estamos tratando de hacer con esta serie de conferencias, tratando de educar tanto a los empleados como a los empleadores acerca de eso, precisamente. Eh, y quiero anunciar para los que todavía no se han desconectado que justamente la próxima semana vamos a trabajar consecuencias, ya no a nivel individual, porque esas son las que muchas veces más se mencionan. ¿Qué consecuencias tiene todo esto para las personas que trabajan en las organizaciones? Pero la próxima semana vamos a tener a una experta en consecuencias organizacionales, es decir, para la empresa, para la organización como tal, qué tipo de consecuencias trae. Y esto muchas veces, es conocer este tipo de datos muchas veces motiva a las empresas más a tomar decisiones y a tomar acciones que las consecuencias que ellas o que las condiciones tienen para sus empleados. Entonces, pues los invito a a conectarse la próxima semana porque, como les digo, vamos a tener un, un tema muy relacionado pero distinto que nos va a ofrecer una información complementaria a la que hemos venido trabajando hasta ahora. Mardi, de nuevo, muchas gracias por tu tiempo, por tus conocimientos. Hay muchas personas eh, agradeciéndonos aquí en el chat, diciendo que les tienen información que no sabían, que les ayudaste a comprender muchas cosas que no entendían. 
y dándote las gracias por la conferencia tan interesante. Nosotros también como organizadores te agradecemos muchísimo por tu tiempo eh, y por o poner a un lado tus condiciones familiares que sabemos que en este momento son complicadas con niño, perro y todo de casa, pero que lograste organizar para poder estar con nosotros. Muchas gracias. See you later. Thank you, Viviola. It's been my pleasure. Marni y Viviola, muchísimas gracias a todas las personas que nos han acompañado, al equipo de trabajo que está detrás de todo esto para que sea una realidad este ciclo de formación. Hoy exactamente llegamos al 50% del desarrollo del ciclo de formación y creo que llegamos a este punto con unos conocimientos muy valiosos y ahí me gustaría hacer énfasis. Recuerden que todo lo que hacemos precisamente lo hacemos para prevenir que estas cosas pasen, que las personas se depriman, que tengan problemas cardiovasculares, que tengan problemas eh, de ansiedad. Lo que pasa es que los riesgos psicosociales para que generen esos efectos en la salud toman mucho tiempo estar expuesto a esas condiciones. Y a veces se nos olvida que es que, aunque pase mucho tiempo, ahí están y están generando problemas y eventualmente esos problemas se van a hacer eh, evidentes. Entonces, me encanta que hubiéramos llegado al 50% del de desarrollo del ciclo con todos estos conocimientos. Nos vemos en una próxima eh, sesión. Recuerden que es el próximo viernes a las 11 de la mañana, donde, como lo menciona Viviola, vamos a hablar sobre las consecuencias, pero ya a nivel organizacional, y el resto de todo el ciclo de formación va a estar focalizado en todo lo que tiene que ver con evaluación, diagnóstico e intervención, que ya son las herramientas que podemos implementar precisamente para controlar todos estos factores de riesgos psicosociales en el origen, que es, como nos lo ha explicado Marlin, el punto más importante de la intervención. Un abrazo para todos y muchísimas gracias nuevamente por su participación. Hasta el próximo viernes.